So this video is part of a, a new series that I kind of want to do. It's, it's really just my thoughts on game design, different things that I've noticed, and particularly from the games that I really enjoy. Uh, I want to know what you guys have noticed as well, so be sure and add to the discussion in the comments here. Now, we're going to be seeing a lot of Breath of the Wild footage here because I think the overworld design in this game is really where this game excels. Now, that kind of leads to like a sidetrack of overworld versus open world. It's kind of a blurry distinction here, I'll admit, in Breath of the Wild. But for today, we're just going to talk about overworld, good overworld design. Nintendo is going to claim this video, so have at it, you guys. So what is an overworld? Well, they tend to be a feature primarily in RPGs, really. It's just an area that connects all other locations in the game. And it's not necessary. A little bit controversial. Uh, Persona 5, for example, has an atypical overworld. Dungeons connect via the real world, but the real world is just a broken up series of smaller locations strung together. Overworlds aren't always one seamless location. Ocarina of Time, for example, has an overworld that isn't one seamless location, but several strung together locations that feel pretty seamless. That was kind of helped along by the cartridge design where load times were really, really low. Uh, Pokemon's overworld is another great example of a strung together locations that comprise a greater overworld, if you could, if you could really call it that. People seem to really miss overworlds when they aren't there. Um, or when the overworld doesn't give a large degree of freedom, right? Like people want to be able to explore and move around in the overworld. And when it feels too quote unquote linear, um, even when alternative overworlds that people really enjoy are actually linear in design, uh, people don't like it. Overworlds exist for a variety of reasons to serve a variety of roles in video games. Uh, they allow for the illusion of choice. Kind of like I was just alluding to, the player feels like they got to choose where to go next, even if maybe that was the only real option. Illusion of choice is huge in video games. They also allow for geographic context in a story. You're going from one kingdom to another. You kind of There's a lot of conflict along the border between these two regions, or maybe there's a culture in this region, and, and it seems to be centered more around the equator, and, and it, things can just tend to fit together and make more sense that way. They can also, and I think most importantly, host a composite genre to keep the player in a state of flow. So in an RPG, this might be introducing adventure elements, uh, could even be flight sims or tactical RPG elements or platforming. See, because when the player gets tired of going through dialogue in a town or puzzles in a dungeon, they might just end their play session right then and there if that's all there really was to experience and pick it up the next day when they're feeling like it again. But the overworld kind of allows you this opportunity to decide to head out and maybe battle some monsters or explore a new corner of the world you haven't seen yet or, or look for some missable content, something you know you can backtrack oftentimes. And that fulfills a different interest for the player. This keeps the player in flow by mixing up the play experience and it delays boredom. And then when you kind of have had enough fun with that, maybe you're like, hey, I'm feeling like going back and talking to some more people, trying to find that missing thing or go back to complete that puzzle in the dungeon because I have a new insight now. There's all kinds of ways that this can manifest, but really I think fundamentally a good overworld contributes to a composite genre that allows for the game to stay more interesting for a longer single period of time. Now, these are, of course, my ramblings on kind of how I see it, but there are no hard and fast rules for what an overworld even should be, or even if there needs to be one at all. One of my favorite video games growing up was X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, and it's really just a flight sim. I mean, there's just no real role for an overworld in that game, and in some ways, you know, if they tried to shoehorn one in, it might not feel right. So there's all kinds of games that just don't need it. On the other hand, you have RPGs like, for example, Dragon Quest. I remember playing my first Dragon Quest game and, you know, you're you're traveling along. All of a sudden you can kind of see in the corner of the map. It looks like there's a place you could reach, but you don't see an obvious way to get there. And it kind of piques your interest and you realize I'm missing something here. And you start trying to look for ways to get there, for example. Zelda games, it's a little different because the overworld is literally where most of the action is happening, where oftentimes, like in Dragon Quest, you're in between areas where action was happening, or you're just out to grind 
get some random encounters in. Zelda, I mean, you're basically in the overworld the whole time if you're not in a dungeon. Overworlds can just be treated like a glorified menu select screen, which I would say is a mistake most of the time. Uh, if you're still allowing for an overworld, but it's not really fulfilling any role other than to just choose a level, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's how Super Mario Brothers 3 works. That's how Super Mario World works. But again, I would say that, if, for example, in Super Mario World, sometimes you can see that there's an area you can get to and you're not sure how to get there. And you think, oh my gosh, there must be an alternate exit to one of these other levels. And you backtrack and, and you see... Yes, there is. There's an alternate exit to this level and you try and find it. That's a way that, again, that overworld can reward the core gameplay of, of the game, where otherwise without that overworld, you might not have seen things that way. All right. Now for the meat and potatoes of what I really wanted to talk about today. Game design rewards certain player behavior. I mean, that's just how it works. So what does good overworld design reward? I would say that it rewards observation and experimentation. Again, good overworld design. Now, observation. Rewarding observation means that you're leaning a little more on the player's own memory than just, say, like quest logs, for example. Um, quest logs can do too much work for the player, and then you just end up coming back and just scrolling through a list of just, eh, what do I need to do next? It doesn't matter if you notice that this cave was suspicious you know, 10 or 15 hours ago in your gameplay, uh, the game noticed it was suspicious and it put a little thing there for you to come back and check it out later. Now, quest logs can remove that sense of satisfaction from the player. Uh, you know, when you, you feel like, oh, you, I figured something out on my own, like wandering past that cave, noticing that it was weird, and then either remembering it and coming back later or just checking it out right then and there. However, a lack of any quest log can result in frustration and players getting lost. And then they just drop your game. They don't come back to it. They don't enjoy their time. So especially in like open world games like Skyrim, for example, where there's just so much stuff, you don't want to overload the player uh, with too much that they feel like they have to do right then and there, especially if there's a larger quest that you would like them to try to follow. They're going to constantly get bombarded by all these little side things that they notice. And if they're constantly taking these little detours, they could completely lose sight of what they were even doing in the first place. So there is a role for quest logs. But I believe that rewarding observation does mean not leaning too heavily on quest logs, because that is where video games can reward the player with the greatest thing they can, which is a sense of accomplishment. I mean, that's really what video games give people in the end, kind of at their peak, is a sense of accomplishment. You don't watch a movie generally and feel accomplished after watching the movie. You don't see a painting and feel accomplished. You could feel accomplished after reading a book if it was a giant book and was a slog to get through. But video games can give people that sense of accomplishment. I think it's important to try and tweak and gear that observation, rewarding a player's observation so that they feel accomplished through their observations. Now, observation can be encouraged by, for example, changing the weather or the time of day or other conditions that make a single location hold more potential secrets. Uh, classic old standby from the Zelda games really is just that if you're out at nighttime, there's going to be these skeletons coming out of the ground. If you're in the same place in the daytime, there aren't. And so there could be areas that are more or less difficult given a time of day or maybe the moon or the sun or something lines up in a way that makes that location uh, highlight a secret or uh, maybe it's raining and you can't climb this thing the first time you're there, but you come back and now you can. And, it, it, you know, maybe the player saw there was something at the top of this cliff. I'm going to come back and check that out later. There's ways that you can encourage observation to make it so that a player hasn't passed the location and said, I got everything I need to out of that. I'm never coming back here again. So the other thing that, it, it, that I was talking about was experimentation. So observation and experimentation. I believe that for experimentation to work at all, the game needs to have a strong, consistent design language. Uh, you know, for example, let's talk about Zelda games again. If, there, if a cracked wall is something that you can bomb or break earlier in the game, but then later in the game you run into cracked walls that you cannot break, which, by the way, does happen in Link to the Past... Um, that is, that's not consistent design language. Uh, if you're showing people things and, and they, and they learn in their head, okay, cracked walls can break, but then they start finding, wait, not every cracked wall can break. So I'm not even going to bother trying to bomb cracked walls anymore. I'm not waste my bombs on that. 
Um, the internal rule set has to remain consistent. So the art direction comes into play there. The little cues and, and, and hints that they're giving through the art direction are what are going to be, tell people where experimentation may be rewarded, where it may not be rewarded. Now, the developers for Breath of the Wild, they call this experimentation multiplicative gameplay. Um, it encourages the player to, you're always looking for new unexpected results by combining a smaller rule set into a, a larger number of outcomes. So you really have a limited number of options or things you can do, but the way those things can interact with each other, for example, lighting a wooden weapon on fire uh, makes it a little stronger when you hit somebody. And so those kinds of things, when you discover them as a player, it's incredibly rewarding and rewarding that experimentation is really important. It's those unexpected outcomes that encourage the player to delve deeper and see, okay, I wonder what else is possible here. Um, this can be really, really difficult to implement in games that have too many variables, lots of items and weapons and, and armor. Uh, the number of permutations, it just can go through the roof really easily. So, and, and you know, that can also make it some, some problems might be too difficult to solve through combining this obscure item with this other obscure item and you would have never tried that in a million years. You don't want to discourage people too much. So it's important to understand not every game obviously can pull off uh, the level ex of experimentation that Breath of the Wild does, for example. But I do believe it can be an incredibly rewarding thing, especially at the overworld level, to mix up the gameplay. So guys, that's it for my rambling right now. I just really want to go more in depth into this in the future, actually make a full, you know, fleshed out video about this. But for right now, I just want to turn it over to you guys and see what else have you noticed that good overworld design rewards. Um, specifically, what overworlds have you particularly enjoyed? And I really want to know what overworlds you have not particularly enjoyed because I think that's almost more telling in a lot of ways. It's easy to see something got something right. That seems so obvious. Of course they would have done that. But looking at games that went wrong, you can really learn a lot from that. So I hope to see you guys again next time. We're going to throw these up here every so often and just uh, talk it out as we kind of figure out our own ideas for what games should and should not be and, and what your guys' ideas are about that. So thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you guys on Wednesday for our podcast. And you're all beasts. See ya.